Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and welcome to part two of what has now turned into a three-part series on the Ken and Barbie killers, Carla Homolka and Paul Bernardo. I should have known it was gonna be a three-part series. I should have known, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I set you up with false expectations, but there's only gonna be one more part after this and all of these parts are gonna come out within a couple of days of each other, so you're not gonna have to wait that long. Before we get started, I want to have a word from our sponsor, and it's a new sponsor today, a new sponsor to this channel, woo! New sponsor, it's exciting when we get new sponsors, talk about them, see what's out there, things we haven't tried before, and I'm excited to tell you about this one. Now, the reason that this sponsor caught my interest when they reached out to me is because perfume. Okay, I've worn the same perfume since I was 14 years old, Clinique Happy the same one. I am now 36 years old, so I mean, I'm not great with math, but that's over 20 years. 20 years wearing the same exact perfume, because I love it, I think it smells great, but I've noticed just recently over the past couple of months, I don't smell it on myself anymore. I'm sure other people still do, but I no longer smell it on myself. And sometimes we just wanna wear perfume for ourselves. We wanna smell ourselves wafting towards our own noses. It's nice to know that you smell good. It's nice to smell that perfume on yourself that you picked because you like how it smells. And now I can't smell it anymore because I've grown used to it. And I researched this, guys, I researched everything. This is actually a common thing. Like you stop smelling things after you smell them so often often or you don't smell them as much. I don't smell my perfume at all anymore. Like I could shove my face into the bottle of perfume and I probably wouldn't smell it. So Scentbird reached out to me and they said, hey, we have this really cool service. Do you wanna try us out? And I looked into it and I was like, actually, I think this is a really good idea. The thing about perfume is it smells different on everybody, depending on your body chemistry. So I could wear a perfume and then my sister could wear the exact same perfume and it would smell different on both of us. That's why buying a new perfume or a new scent can be stressful because you can look at reviews online and people will be like, oh, this smells great, but you don't know if it's gonna smell the same on you, and it's not like we're going into stores right now and trying new perfumes on. But Scentbird allows you to test out loads of top perfumes for a fraction of the price. You can mix it up and try fresh new scents every single month. Scentbird is a monthly subscription service that lets you sample over 600 fragrances as well as skincare, makeup, and wellness products. Just choose the items you want to test drive for the month, and you can get up to three items you want delivered to your door with free shipping. Scentbird also partners with all of the top brands like Prada, Gucci, and Versace, as well as indie labels like Glacier, Nest, and Toka, so you know you're getting 100% authentic scents all the time. So they come in this really cute box, and, and they come with like little velvet bags sometimes, and then they come with cards, and the cards, just like with um, Bright Sellers, when you get your wines, you get cards that tell you about the notes and what you compare it with and stuff. These cards tell you all about the perfumes that you've chosen. So I chose K Kate Spade, Live Color Fully, Tommy Bahama, Maritime Deep Blue, Anna Sue, Fantasia, Versace, Bright Crystal, Versace, Poor Home, Versace, Eros, and Badgley Mishka, Forest Noir. I used to love Badgley Mishka back in the day, but I did pick a couple of these for Adam too because I was like, I don't wanna be greedy. And this is for men and women. Scentbird can be used by men or women because there's male scents, female scents. I also like to wear male scents sometimes. In a pinch, like when we're on vacation and I forget my perfume, I use Adam's cologne all the time. So, and the really cool thing is they give you a pretty good amount of fragrance. So this is one of them. This is um, Versace Bright Crystal. Oh, it smells so good. But it comes in this little kind of like, um, I don't know, bottle with like a perfume cap on it. But what you're meant to do is put it in this container and it's so cool because it twists up like a lipstick, see? And then the scent comes out and you spray it. Which one is, oh. Hmm, just like that, and then twist it back and throw it in your purse or your pocket or whatever, or your book bag. It doesn't matter, it's not gonna spill out, it's not gonna get all over the place, and you can bring it with you on the go. Great for vacations. I'll never have to use Adam's cologne again, even though I probably will, because I like, I like how it smells. Now I smell like delicious cotton candy, like I'm at Coney Island at this moment. So when you order with Scentbird, you're gonna get one of these refillable cases free with your first order. So if you're interested in trying Scentbird, there's a link in the description box and Scentbird is giving viewers of this channel 30% off of your first order, which is only $10. 
You can also download Scentbirds app. It's on iOS and Android. It's easy to use. It'll make rating your perfumes and browsing for perfumes much easier. And you can also find that link in the description box. Okay, thank you so much Scentbird for sponsoring this video. Thank you for opening my eyes to a really cool new service. And thank you guys as always for listening to the sponsor. As you know, they keep this channel afloat. Now let's launch right into part two of the Ken and Barbie Killers Serial Killer series. So in part one, we talked about the childhoods and the backgrounds of Carla Homoka and Paul Bernardo. We talked about how they met, how they fell madly in love, became obsessed with each other, and discovered a darkness in the other. A darkness that apparently didn't scare either one of them off. Today in part two, we're going to talk about how Carla and Paul teamed up, cooperated, you know, teamwork makes the dream work. They worked together in order to take three young lives pointlessly, without any reason and without any remorse, in my opinion. So this might go without saying, but if you have not seen part one yet, you should go and, and watch that first, because one comes before two. And I'm gonna put the link in the description box, so if you need to, you can find it quickly. If you've just come upon this video and you didn't know there was a part one, there is a part one, go watch that first, and then come back here and see us. Once again, I also do wanna say, I really enjoy that you guys watch these videos with your families and your kids, and for the most part, I really do try to keep it you know, PG and try to keep it um, completely child-friendly and family-friendly, even though this isn't a child and family-friendly channel. I know sometimes that kids can be around when, when, you, when you don't want them to, and you wanna do Sorry, there was a piece of dust flying in the air. I didn't want it to go in my coffee. <laughs> Anyways, you want to do what you want to do. You still want to watch your YouTube videos, but you don't want to scar your children for life. So I try to keep it pretty PG and, you know, I try to not come right out and say things. And I'm still going to do that here. But still, I, I just don't think it's something that they should watch or listen to or be present for ever. So at the end of November, the plan to give her sister to her future husband was in full swing. Carla knew that Valium wasn't going to be enough. It had only made Tammy sleepy, and when Paul had tried to touch her, she'd stirred as if she was going to wake up. On top of that, the Valium tasted bitter. Remember when I said that Carla's friends had noticed whenever Paul gave them drinks, there was like white stuff floating in there or white powder on the top or a white film? That's because there was, because Carla and Paul were experimenting on Carla's friends crushing up Valium and putting it in their drinks so they could figure out how sleepy it really did make you, how much it put you out, how deep under it put you. But like I said, Carla's friends had always seemed to notice the white flecks and they tasted the bitterness of the Valium, so they never really finished the drinks. Now Carla toyed with the idea of using sleeping pills, but she knew that that wouldn't be enough. So she borrowed a medical reference book from the vet clinic she worked at. It was called The Compendium of Pharmaceuticals and Specialties. And she took this book home so she could read up on the drug called Halcyon. Now her mother had used Halcyon in the past and Carla knew it knocked her mom right out. And the book said it was fairly safe to use. On top of that, Carla could easily get her hands on some. The clinic she worked at didn't stock it, but she was in charge of ordering and picking up the drugs if they were needed. So all she had to do was put in an order and walk across the street to the drugstore to get it and then put it in her pocket. Once she had the Halcyon in her hands, Carla formulated her plan. Wouldn't her sister's virginity be a perfect Christmas gift for Paul, the man who had everything? But Carla wanted to make sure there'd be no chance of Tammy waking up this time so she grabbed something else from the clinic as well, halothane, a chemical that would be administered to animals through a mask before surgery. It would put them to sleep so they wouldn't feel anything or remember anything. So halothane would typically be something that you would inhale and it'd have to be mixed with oxygen in a very low ratio. So only one or two parts of the drug per hundred parts oxygen in an undiluted form it could be and would be incredibly dangerous. Now, Carla knew this considering she'd used it to put many animals to sleep before surgery. She had a whole book on drugs and their benefits, their downfalls, but she pocketed a couple bottles of it anyways and brought them home. But Carla didn't have the equipment at home to vaporize the halothane with oxygen. So she planned on just putting a little bit of it on a rag and holding it over her sister's face. Later, she would testify she'd never wanted to hurt Tammy. She just wanted her future husband to have the younger girl out of his system before they got married. And Paul had made her do it. 
Anyways, if she'd said no, he threatened to hit her, and eventually he just wore her down. So she's putting it as like, okay, I thought it was just an obsession, one time, and he would be out of his system, and then we could get back to normal. Now, after Paul had been interviewed by police and had his blood taken to compare to the DNA found on his victims, he went over to Carla's house and picked her up. She claimed he was in a real agitated state, worried that they would arrest him for these crimes. She tried to reassure him that simply looking like a sketch of the suspect wasn't enough to arrest someone, but they decided to go to the library together so they could make a list of dates and times for all the attacks and sort of figure out a way that they could say Paul was someplace else at that time. While they're at the library, Paul's going through like newspaper articles and newspaper stories about the Scarborough rapist, writing down dates on a piece of paper, and Carla, at the same time, is making a grocery list on the same piece of paper. So they're writing down a list of sexual assaults, and Carla's like, huh, now that we're talking about lists, we need some stuff from the store. She put on the list that they needed sun in for Paul's hair, hairspray for her, and favor cards for their wedding. They're sitting at this library together working on a way to get Paul an alibi um, for these attacks or try to find the similar attacks that he hadn't been involved in in order to cast doubt on his involvement in any of them. Carla's over here planning her wedding and she knew her fiance was a rapist. She knew law enforcement was onto him and had his DNA and she really needed to get all the wedding plans straight because time was running out before the date they would say I do. Remember, Carla would tell police later that she had no idea he was the Scarborough rapist until the night of their wedding. That's what she claimed. That is the first time he told her. Then I'd have to question, Carla, why you're at the library with him making a list of dates and times of sexual assaults in Scarborough so that he could rule himself out of that. On the weekend of December 8th, Carla's parents were out of town and they did this every year to celebrate their wedding anniversary. Carla and Paul salivated at the idea of an empty house with just the two of them and Tammy. Since Carla's other sister Lori always went out on weekends, so Paul and Carla are like, okay, parents are out of town, Lori's gonna be out, we are going to be alone with Tammy, this is the perfect time to finally do it. But Lori decided to stay in that weekend, so their plan was ruined. Paul was getting more and more focused on Tammy. She was starting to become his obsession, and Carla hated it. More than anything, she wanted to just get the whole thing over with so Paul could focus on her again. Her wish was granted on Christmas Eve, 1990. There was a little family gathering going on at the Homokas. Paul had made Carla buy him a new Sony video camera with her credit card, you know, because he doesn't have credit. And he was recording everything. He loved recording everything. The couple showed up with armfuls of gifts, and Paul recorded Carla's mother cooking in the kitchen, Carla's father on the couch watching the news, the presents under the tree. That evening, everyone indulged in eggnog, even Tammy, who was just a few weeks away from her 16th birthday. Now, the Homolkas apparently didn't have an issue with their teenage daughter drinking. It wasn't a hard and fast rule that she should not, and as long as everyone was home and safe, they didn't mind if Tammy had a few holiday drinks. Paul and Carla prepared a special drink for her, a daiquiri laced with halcyon. At one point, Tammy exclaimed out of nowhere, and this is on videotape, these guys are trying to poison me, and for a moment, Carla thought they'd been caught, that the gig was up but no one seemed to have even heard her. Are you in the Christmas cheer? That's all I want to know. Yeah. You are? So Tammy went upstairs to her bedroom to call a friend. Paul recorded the family around the Christmas tree, minus Tammy, who had not yet come out of her room. Now here's the thing, Carla was allegedly upset with Paul at this point because Paul was taking pictures and videos of Carla and Lori and their parents by the Christmas tree. And this went against their tradition. Every year at Christmas, they would all take a picture in front of the tree together. And then the three girls would take a picture in front of the tree together. But Tammy wasn't there, and, and Carla didn't like that Paul was kind of going against this tradition. Now, I have an inkling, based on her personality, based on what I know of her, and I think at this point I know quite a lot, Carla didn't really care so much about the sentimental value of having this picture taken every year. It was more of she's a controlling personality. She's a little bit obsessive compulsive. And when a person is OCD like that, they don't they don't always know the reason behind why they're doing their rituals all the time. And and maybe they did know at one point, but that's no longer the reason they're doing them. They're they're doing them because they're compelled to. So I really think that that was Carla's issue. It is estimated that at this point, Tammy had ingested between 10 to 12 5 milligram halcyon pills. She was still awake, and Lori told Carla and Paul they should stop making her drinks because she was getting too drunk. Then Lori went to bed, 
just as Tammy came back downstairs to watch a movie with her sister and Paul. Mr. and Mrs. Homolka went to bed, leaving Paul, Carla, and Tammy in the living room together. Paul and Carla were on the couch, Tammy was on the other couch, and they watched her intently until she finally passed out. Now what I'm about to tell you is disturbing, but I'm going to give you only the facts you need to know. It's not necessary to dive into all the gory details. I promise you. Once Tammy was asleep, Carla retrieved the halothane while Paul set up his new camera. She poured some on a rag and placed it over her sister's mouth and nose. Paul pulled down Tammy's pants, Carla pushed up her shirt, and Paul raped the young girl while Carla whispered to him to hurry before someone came downstairs. As this was happening, Carla checked Tammy's breathing and periodically poured more halothane on the cloth, placing it back over Tammy's mouth and nose. And then they switched positions, and Paul recorded while he barked orders at Carla, telling her what to do to her unconscious sister. And she did everything he asked, with a smile. But when Paul got on top of Tammy again, she began to vomit. Both Carla and Paul began to panic. Carla turned Tammy over so she wouldn't choke on her own vomit, and Paul tried to clear her mouth out. They then carried her into the basement where Carla's bedroom was located and dropped her on the floor. They hurriedly put her clothes back on and performed mouth to mouth, but Tammy was not responding. Carla called 911 and then worked quickly to hide the evidence of their nefarious plan, dumping the rest of the halothane down the drain and hiding the pills. When the ambulance arrived, the sirens woke up the sleeping homokas. Paul tried to calm them while Carla watched the paramedics helping Tammy, wheeling her out to the ambulance with a tube down her throat to help her breathe. When Carla's parents asked what had happened, they simply told them that Tammy had just stopped breathing. Paul, Carla, and Lori were questioned by police while Tammy and her parents went to the hospital. The officer on duty thought that this was more than a young girl who had drank too much, but he didn't think it was more in the way that, that it was. He asked whether drugs had been involved. See, Tammy had a strange burn on her face that couldn't be explained easily. Had they been freebasing? Carla and Paul said no. The marks on Tammy's face happened when they had dragged her across the carpet when they were trying to revive her. Now, the mark on Tammy's face was from the halothane. It had been in such a high concentration, held to her face for so long, the chemical had burned her skin. Tammy was pronounced dead upon her arrival at the hospital, but she'd been dead before the ambulance had even arrived to pick her up from home. There's so much more to the attack on Tammy Homolka that I, I can't say. I don't want to say, I don't want to relive that. Um, in the description box, I'm going to give you some sources, some books and podcasts that go into a little bit more detail if you're interested. The only reason I could see for going into more detail and explaining exactly what Carla and Paul did to Tammy Homolka is so that you understand how truly monstrous these people were. There are things that happened to Tammy that I can't say. There are things that happened to Tammy that are unimaginable. And they were done to her by her older sister. Her sister. Now, I have a little sister who's seven years younger than me. I remember when I first heard about this case years ago, it was on a podcast, and I was listening in my car. And I sobbed when this part of the story came up. Just driving down the road, I sobbed. Because I thought of my little sister, and I just could not ever imagine letting anybody ever do anything like that to her much less taking part in it myself. So just trust me when I say I can't go into these details. There are sources if you want to know more and I'll link them in the description box. Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka were absolute monsters. So the police officer who was still questioning Carla and Paul and Lori was named Constable David Weeks. Constable is not his first name, it's his title. I know that I said that weirdly, but he was still interviewing them. And he got the call from the hospital the cops who were still at the hospital, saying that Tammy had not survived. And according to him, when he broke the news, Lori ran upstairs crying, and he went to check on her. And when he came back down, Tammy was throwing blankets that were covered in vomit into the washing machine. Now, Weeks ran to stop her and retrieve the evidence, allegedly. I don't believe him, by the way, but that's what he says. Um, but the things had already gotten wet, so any evidence that was on them, it would pretty much be destroyed. When Lori came back downstairs, Carla hugged her. They hugged each other. They cried about the loss of their sister. And Paul sat on the couch, rocking back and forth, slapping himself in the face and head, screaming. So Carla's first reaction when her sister is pronounced dead 
was not to comfort her sister Lori, who was genuinely upset. That came after she went on a mission to destroy the evidence of her attack on her younger sister. After an hour of waiting at the police station, Paul and Carla were questioned separately, and what was notable was that their stories were very similar, too similar. They recalled the events of that night using the same language, the same words, and this is usually a red flag for law enforcement because it signifies that two people have gotten together to make sure that their stories are straight, probably in the hour that they were allowed to sit together before being interviewed. And why would innocent people feel the need to make sure their stories were straight? Additionally, the coroner claimed that he didn't believe the rug burn story. The burn on Tammy's face had not come from a rug. It was a chemical burn, but the coroner and the police didn't know about the halothane. So Tammy's death was listed as accidental, and this kills me, guys, kills me. There is admittedly a lot of poor police work in this whole case. In this whole case with Carla and Paul, there's some really bad and negligent police work. But this, right at really the beginning, it's so irresponsible. The police officer who went to question them thought that they were acting weird and not telling him everything. Then he sees Carla washing evidence of Tammy's attack. Then they go to the police station and they have the same exact stories, which is suspicious. And then we have this burn on Tammy's face that can't really be explained. And the coroner's like, oh, it's Christmas Eve. Just wanna get home to my kids. Accidental death. Carla and Paul were never questioned about the death of 15-year-old Tammy Lynn Homoka again. Now I do wanna mention something that I think is important. The morning after Tammy died, Dorothy Homoka, Tammy and Carla's mother, asked her friend Lynn to go with her and Carl to help pick out a casket for her daughter. Now, according to Lynn, it stunned her how the homokas showed no emotion. Not one tear was shed the entire three hours. Afterwards, Dorothy and Carl went to lie down and rest, and Lynn went home. But she came back later, and at that point, Dorothy informed her that, yeah, they'd gone upstairs to lay down, but they ended up having sex instead of sleeping. Now, I don't want to tell someone how to react in a time of loss. Everybody mourns differently. But this is the day after your 15-year-old daughter has died. You just went that same day to pick out a coffin for her. I don't think sex would be the first thing on my mind. I don't know. You guys let me know what you think. I think it's really strange, really odd. Another thing that was odd that was reported is Dorothy Homoka had a bunch of different stories to explain to people why there was that mark on Tammy's face. She told one friend that Tammy had struggled with bad acne and that's what it was from. Later, she told the same friend that Tammy had just had an allergic reaction to some makeup she'd been wearing. And again, she told another person that the burn was from excessive mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. Tammy was laid to rest on December 27th during an open casket funeral where Carla kept walking over to the coffin and fixing her sister's hair and clothes. Carla was OCD. She had this obsessive need to control things, to write things, to do something, to make her feel in control of a situation that she had absolutely no control over. Despite the funeral home's best efforts, that large raspberry colored burn that traveled from Tammy's mouth down to her chin and neck was still visible. To Carla and Paul, it was a reminder of the night that he'd finally gotten what he wanted. Maybe things hadn't gone the way they planned, but next time they would know how to execute their plan better so that no one died and there would be a next time. The two of them would always insist that Tammy's death had been an accident. It was not their intended result and Paul was upset with his fiance, blaming her for things going so terribly wrong and putting a damper on his evening he told her that she owed him a redo. Now, in my opinion, I do think that Paul was more upset about Tammy's death than Carla was. And I do think that it wasn't Paul's intention to have Tammy die. Carla was the one who was using the halothane on her sister's face. Carla seemed not upset at all after her sister died. In fact, she was very agitated that her parents seemed to be having a hard time getting past it. Just weeks after Tammy's death, Carla was writing her friends letters saying, ugh, my parents are so annoying. Now they want Paul to leave the house. They don't want him living here anymore. Now they're saying that, you know, the wedding should be smaller, that we shouldn't invite as many people. They don't want to pay for all that they were going to pay for. They're 
you know, pulling money out. This is absolutely ridiculous. Tammy was always their favorite. If it was Tammy's wedding, they would pay for everything. This wouldn't be an issue. So she's like complaining about how her sister was her parents' favorite and how they're upset that her sister's dead and it's affecting her negatively and her wedding plans. This is not somebody who feels really bad about, you know, killing her sister. Well, the weekend of January 12th saw Carla's parents out of town again and Lori visiting their grandparents in Mississauga. Paul and Carla went on the prowl for another girl that they could bring back to her parents' house and Paul could do whatever he wanted while Carla watched. They did find someone and they called this woman January Girl because they didn't know her name and they didn't care. They recorded Paul with this girl while Carla stood in the doorway and watched. And after he was done doing what he was doing, they let her go. And Carla hoped that this would be enough to refocus Paul on what was important, their wedding and their future together. After this, Carla remembered feeling bad for Paul since Tammy wasn't around anymore and he had loved her so much. So she pretended to be her deceased younger sister to make him happy. She put Tammy's clothes on, she did her hair like Tammy used to do her hair and they recorded the whole thing. During the video, Carla tells Paul how much she loves what he did to her sister and she loved what he made her do to her sister and she calls him King. When Paul asks Carla, what did it teach you? She responded, well, we like little girls. When he asked her how little, she said 13. I can't really once again get into what was said and seen later on video, but it's pretty clear. If you read the transcripts, Carla was more than willing to continue this fantasy with Paul to encourage it, to build on it. Later, she would play the victim role as if she was just one more woman that Paul had abused and used, but she's more than happy to be there. You'll never convince me otherwise. At some point towards the end of the video, she tells him, I want you to do it again. If you want to do it 50 times more, we can do it 50 times more. We can do it every weekend. We can do it whenever you want. She tells him she will go with him to pick out a girl or she'll just stay behind and clean up afterwards, like she did with Tammy, because she loves him, because he's the king, because he deserves it. After Tammy's memorial service on Friday, January 18th, 1991, Carla and Paul went out to dinner, they sipped wine, and they made plans to get their own place and move in together. Carla's parents, once again, had been giving her trouble about having Paul living at, at their house, essentially, since he really never left. He was on bad terms with his own parents. He didn't want to be there. He'd been staying a lot at the Homokas, and they said they needed family time now to be together. Now that Tammy was gone, they all needed to mourn together. But I think it was because they suspected Paul had a hand in what happened to Tammy. Well, Paul didn't want to go back to Scarborough and live with his parents, and Carla was mad at her parents because they were telling her to rein in her spending on her wedding and, you know, telling her Paul couldn't live there. So they said, this is just the best idea that we move in together. That way we can do whatever we want with whoever we want. No one can hold anything over our heads and we'll be in the comfort and safety of a place that's ours alone. We won't have to sneak around as much. We'll have a place to bring these girls. They found the perfect place, located at 57 Bayview in Port de Lucie. It was a great Cape Cod style bungalow with $100,000 worth of renovations right by the water and they were able to rent it for a song. Port de Lucie is a small suburb of St. Catharines, a quiet and peaceful harbor town. The owners of the house made money on the side buying properties and fixing them up to flip and they'd spent so much time and money on the house they wouldn't take anything less than $269,000 for it. But the real estate market wasn't great at this time. The house sat there for a while, it didn't sell and they decided to just rent it out before they got any more in the hole and they thought Carla and Paul were the perfect couple to live there. The house was nicer than anywhere Paul or Carla had ever lived. It had French doors, a jacuzzi, hardwood floors. It was decorated with tasteful neutrals. It was all very modern and luxurious and Carla felt that things were finally falling into place. She was a princess, Paul was Prince Charming, and now they had their castle. It was also closer to Buffalo, so it would be easy for Paul to continue traveling to the US and back, bringing cigarettes. Sometimes he did this two or three times a day. In March, Carla encouraged Paul to go to Florida for two weeks with Van and some other guys. Now these other guys were like 16 and 17 years old. Van and Paul were 25 and 26, but this is a trademark of Paul Bernardo and his emotionally stunted friends. They liked being around the younger guys, almost the same way they preferred being around younger women and almost in the same way that Paul preferred to stalk and attack younger women. 
for the first half of their trips, the guys picked up various girls and sent them away the next morning, but when they went to Daytona Beach, Paul met a woman. She was a 24-year-old nurse from South Carolina named Allison, and this woman gave him everything he wanted in the bedroom. This caused a little bit of a moral quandary, a confusion inside Paul's mind and heart. He knew he loved Carla, he knew Carla understood and got him, but now he thought that he loved Allison too. I mean, Allison was, you know, a freak in the sheets, but a lady in the streets. She had a good job. She took care of people. She seemed to have a good heart. She wasn't dark and twisty, but she still provided him with, you know, the things he liked. He lied to Allison though. He told her that his little sister Tammy had recently passed, that she had died in his arms, and now he lived with his other sister Carla in a house in Port de Lucie. So Carla, in an attempt to be the cool girl, sends her fiance away to Florida with his buddies for spring break, thinking that it's gonna win her some brownie points with Paul, and he ends up meeting another woman and then telling this other woman that Carla is his sister. Ouch. Paul didn't get back to Carla on time because he took a detour from Florida to South Carolina to see where Allison lived and meet her family and friends. When he finally returned, he didn't hide anything. He didn't lie. He told Carla everything. He even showed her pictures of him and Allison kissing. Now, Carla didn't know what to do. What could she do? Hadn't she given him everything he wanted and more? Hadn't she sacrificed her sister for him? Didn't she do all that he asked without question, many times completely willingly and happily? Their time living together after this was very tense, understandably, and they argued a lot. Paul seemed very sensitive to things in his environment, like noise and smells. He hated the smell of cleaning products and bleach, but Carla obsessively clean, and she used a ton of cleaning products, making sure the house was always spotless. So Carla decided to do something that had always seemed to bring her and Paul closer in the past, something she believed no other girl would do for him or with him. On April 6th, 1991, Paul went out hunting again to pick another victim, 14-year-old Karina Jenkins was out jogging early that morning to Henley Island in St. Catharines. She was on her school's rowing team and she wanted to get a warm-up in before practice that day, so she'd left her house early at 5 a.m. As she was going on her way, she felt that there was someone following her. She turned and she looked. She saw a man about 50 feet away. Now she sped up. She felt suspicious of this man. You know, it was really early in a location where mostly people jogged and worked out and he was just wearing street clothes. You know, he wasn't wearing exercise clothes. He wasn't running. He was just kind of walking behind her. And as she peered over her shoulder again, she saw a station wagon slowly pass her, driven by a blonde woman who waved at her. Now, as Corinna was processing this, she was grabbed from behind and the man's hands came up over her mouth to stifle her screams. He brought her into the woods and told her everything was going to be okay, but that she shouldn't try anything or she would regret it. He then assaulted her and left her naked by a tree before telling her to wait five minutes before she left. If she didn't wait, he would know and he would come back and kill her. Now, it's been speculated that the blonde woman driving the station wagon that waved at Corinna was Carla. Um, I'm not a fan of Carla, but I don't think so. I think it was really just somebody driving by and, and waving at her. Because later, when Paul and Carla were driving around Port de Lucie, Paul proudly pointed out a young, dark-haired girl walking down the street, and he told Carla, that's the girl I raped. So Carla's putting this together. Paul needs other women. But not for love or companionship, just for sex. This is what she can give him to keep him happy with her. Remember, I told you in the first video, don't feel too bad for Carla Homolka. Although she would later claim to be a victim, she was not, in the least. Carla had met a girl when she worked at the pet shop in St. Catharines. This girl's name was Jane. She was 12 when Carla met her. Once things started getting tense and awkward with Paul, and Carla knew she was seeing other girls, Carla needed to do something to get the ball back in her court. And Jane looked so much like her dad sister Tammy. She couldn't wait to present her to Paul as a wedding gift. At this time, Jane was 15, and when she got the call from Carla out of the blue, she was excited. She'd always liked Carla. Carla was always nice to her when she came into the pet shop. Every time new puppies came in, they would talk about animals. They both really liked dogs. She really looked up to Carla. And Carla asked Jane, hey, you want to come to my house, my new house, meet my new puppy? I know you like dogs, and you can, you know, have a sleepover. It'll be like a girl's night. My fiancé is going to be out of town. It's going to be awesome. 
So once Jane got there, they watched Ghost, you know, with Patrick Swayze, Demi Moore. They played with Buddy the dog, and they had some drinks. Carla took pictures of Jane playing with her large Rottweiler puppy and continued to hand the girl drinks laced with Halcyon. Then she called Paul and told him to get home, quick. She had a surprise for him. And because using halothane had worked so well the first time, Carla decided to try again with Jane. Now, Paul was nervous, but Carla reassured him that something with Tammy had gone wrong. But this time, she would get it right. Together, Carla and Paul sexually assaulted this young girl. Afterwards, they put her to bed. She woke up the next morning with a horrible headache, not remembering a thing. Paul and Carla drove her home, and Jane stayed in bed for the next three days, sick with what she thought was the flu. Now, both Paul and Carla were overjoyed at how perfectly the whole thing had gone. Paul was only upset that they hadn't gotten it right with Tammy. He was like, Carla, if you knew how to do this the whole time, why didn't you do it the first time? Remember, when Paul was a kid, he would always, you know, shine and everything. Boy Scouts, school, he was great. But nothing was ever good enough for his parents. So it's not really a surprise that he grew into a man that was hard to please and satisfy. On June 14th, 1991, Paul went and picked up their marriage license in preparation for their wedding in two weeks which 150 guests had been invited. It was going to be a huge, huge event. He drove home and picked Carla up to go on a cigarette run. They passed the border into New York around 7.36 p.m. and they were back before 10. Paul went back out to meet Van and hand over the cigarettes so they could be sold. He spotted Leslie Mahaffey walking into the backyard of a house in a residential neighborhood in Burlington. Leslie was 14 years old in the ninth grade at M.M. Robinson High School. She had just come home from attending the wake of a friend of hers who had tragically died in a car accident. After the wake, she and some friends went to the woods to drink and remember this friend. And afterwards, they walked her home. But when she got home, she'd missed her curfew and the door was locked. Now, she had kind of been rebelling lately and her parents had told her, you know, you can't keep coming home late. If you do come home late, we're going to lock the door and you won't be able to get in. They were trying to teach her a lesson. So once they figured out that the door was locked, Leslie's friends were concerned, but she sent them away and she was like, listen, the front door will be open. I'll just ring the doorbell, whatever, it's fine. And they left. But after they left, she discovered that the front door was locked too. And I think she didn't want to ring the doorbell, but she didn't want to get in trouble. She walked to find a payphone and she called one of her friends, Amanda. She told Amanda, you know, all about the things that had happened, the week, what they did after, who was there. And then she asked Amanda, you know, I'm locked out. Do you think that I can come and spend the night at your house tonight, just this once? Amanda didn't think that would be a good idea because her little sister was sick and the last time Leslie had slept over, Leslie's mother had given Amanda's mother hell for it. Amanda told Leslie, listen, just ring the doorbell. Surely someone's gonna, you know, wake up and let you in. But Leslie sounded worried and stressed and she kept repeating that she didn't want to go home. Leslie never did get into her house that night because she met Paul Bernardo while she was trying to figure out how to get in. The next day, she didn't attend her friend Chris's funeral but Leslie's mother assumed she had just run away again and phoned the police reporting her daughter as a runaway. But Leslie had not run away. She was being held captive by Paul Bernardo and Carla Homoka. When Paul saw her that night, he claims he had just been planning to like peep on her and watch her. But then she noticed him and asked him what he was doing. He told her he was breaking into a nearby house and he asked if she wanted a cigarette. And she said she did. And then she trustingly followed him to his car where he said the cigarettes were. He got into the driver's seat. She got into the passenger seat. And he handed her the cigarette as promised. As he was handing her the cigarette, he asked what her name was. She told him and asked what his name was. And she's completely unaware at this point that she's in danger. Until he pulled a knife out from under the seat of his car and said, it doesn't matter. He made her put a shirt over her head. And he drove her back to the house in Port de Lucie that he shared with Carla. When they got there, Carla was already in bed and asleep, and Paul woke her up with excitement, telling her he'd brought someone home. He told her to stay in bed, to be quiet, and not to come down for a while, but Carla didn't listen. When Paul had gone back downstairs, Carla snuck to the top of the stairs and looked down. She spotted Leslie kneeling on the living room floor with Paul's red turtleneck wrapped around her head and face. She also watched Paul tell the girl to undress and turn his video camera on. Carla did not rush down and demand Paul to let the girl go. She didn't call the police. She went back to bed and fell asleep. When she woke up the next morning, Carla saw something that upset her very much. 
And it wasn't a kidnapped girl still held captive in her house. Two champagne glasses sat on the table downstairs. They were their good champagne glasses from France that they never used. The ones that Carla had specially ordered for their wedding. And Paul had brought them out to have champagne and share a drink with this uninvited girl he'd brought home. Carla took the dog for a walk. She's getting more and more pissed off with every moment that passes. Now keep in mind, Leslie is still at their house, still being used and tortured by Paul. But Carla was not bothered by that. She was annoyed that he had given this girl something to drink out of her precious French champagne flutes. And this made her angry towards Leslie because she's an irrational, crazy person. When she got home from walking the dog, Paul and Leslie were someplace in the house. Carla didn't go to check on them. She didn't go to see if Leslie needed help. She didn't even go to see if Leslie was still alive. She settled in with a cup of tea to read a new book she'd just gotten, and that's what she did for the rest of the afternoon. She read American Psycho. I'm not kidding. She was really enjoying it. And more than likely, she saw her own fiancé in the twisted, dark mind of Patrick Bateman, the story's main character. Maybe she even saw herself in Patrick Bateman. Leslie was kept prisoner and abused for between 24 and 36 hours. Paul videotaped her going to the bathroom. He recorded her taking a shower while she was still blindfolded by this turtleneck. She was blindfolded the whole time. Maybe this kept her calm. Maybe she felt that she was going to be okay and this man was going to let her go. That's why he didn't want her to see his face. So she did what he asked. Eventually, later that night, Paul brought Carla in. Now, she had been watching Leslie and Paul for some time. But then Paul asked Leslie if she'd ever considered being with two people at once. And Carla whispered to Paul, tell her the other person is a woman. Paul and Carla assaulted Leslie at the same time, making sure to get it all on tape. And Carla gave Leslie her teddy bear to hold while this was happening to make her feel better. Then Carla took control of the video camera while Paul violated Leslie in the only way that was left. And as Leslie cried out for help, Carla didn't flinch. She just kept recording. It's unknown how Leslie died. Paul claimed she had been over drugged and Carla claimed Paul choked her to death with a black electrical cord. But by the time she was found, it was impossible to tell. After she died, they moved her body to the basement and put her by a sack of potatoes covered with blankets. The next day was Father's Day. They were having Carla's mother and father and sister over for dinner. The Homokas stayed roughly eight hours that day and they never knew anything was off. At one point, Carla's mother asked if she should go to the basement and get the potatoes, to which Carla sweetly replied, no, I can get the potatoes, and she went to the basement. She claims when she got the potatoes and saw the body of Leslie, she was so grossed out, it ruined her dinner. After this, Paul and Carla used a circular saw to cut Leslie into pieces, which they then encased in cement and threw into Lake Gibson. Why did they kill Leslie? Was it an accident? Later, Paul would say that it was because she said her blindfold had slipped, and she can be heard saying this in the final moments of that horrible video, that her blindfold was slipping. But you can clearly see, allegedly, I haven't seen the video, but it's said that you can see her blindfold had not slipped. Carla would later claim that she hadn't helped Paul kill Leslie, she hadn't helped Paul cut the body up or get rid of the body. He'd done that all on Monday while she was at work, but he's always stuck to the story that she was there the whole time. Even if she wasn't there in the aftermath when he was getting rid of the body, she was there when Leslie was being attacked and killed. And we'll find out that when Carla finally does come clean, she lies about almost everything. It had been two weeks and Leslie had not come home. Her mother was now starting to realize that her young daughter had most likely not run away, so the runaway case turned into a missing persons case. On Saturday, June 29th, 1991, Paul and Carla were married at Niagara on the Lake in front of 150 of their closest friends and family. At the same time that the bride and groom were having their first dance as a married couple, Bill Greckel and his wife were heading out for a twilight canoe ride on historic Lake Gibson. There was another man there. Um, his name was Mike Doucette, and he was fishing from the shore on Lake Gibson with his son. Now, as Bill and his wife passed Mike, Bill shouted something out to Mike about a strange fish in cement. And Mike was a little agitated about this, right? Because he was trying to fish, and usually when you're fishing, you want it to be quiet. And this stranger kept, like, shouting to him about something. Apparently, when Bill and his wife were trying to put their canoe into the water, he had tripped over a concrete block that had split open, and it looked like it held a purplish fish that he'd never seen before. 
And as Mike was fishing, annoyed by this loud motorized canoe and Bill and his wife shouting, Bill passed again and shouted again, did you see it? He yelled to Mike that the concrete looked like it held body parts. Exasperated, Mike went over to the place Bill indicated and he saw exactly what Bill was talking about. Leslie was found and 15 miles away, Paul and Carla gazed into each other's eyes and danced the night away with music and drinks and laughter without a care in the world. It had been a fairy tale wedding. After they said their vows, Paul and Carla took a trip around Niagara on the lake in a horse-drawn carriage, sipping champagne out of their prized flutes and waving to everyone as if they were royalty. After the reception, Paul and Carla packed and headed to Buffalo, where they would board a plane to Hawaii for their honeymoon. As the newlywed Bernardos began packing for their honeymoon, the parts of Leslie's body were being recovered in eight separate cement blocks, described as being roughly the size of small coffins. These blocks were sent to Hamilton General Hospital for autopsy. The medical examiner had to use a sledgehammer and chisel to remove the body parts from the blocks. Block 1 contained the left upper arm, block 2 contained the right upper arm, inside block 3 was Leslie's head, and so on. On a Hawaiian beach, Paul and Carla frolicked in the sand, and Paul recorded Carla sunning herself in her bikini. When they got back, the Hamokas picked them up from the Buffalo airport, and on the way back to St. Catharines, they informed the newlyweds about the human remains found in Lake Gibson. It was a big story in town. St. Catharines was considered to be a safe place. This had shocked the community, and Paul and Carla were also shocked. They'd thought that dismembering Leslie and encasing her in cement would ensure she was never found, but the blocks had been thrown into only three feet of water, which had actually prompted police to believe the killer hadn't been from the area because he or she didn't know the lake. If the blocks had been dumped from the bridge just 300 feet further up the road, Leslie most likely would never have been found since the water there was much deeper. After they got back from Hawaii, Carla had a prescription filled for Halcyon from two different doctors. She and Paul then had Jane and her mother over for dinner. So after Jane had spent the night at Carla and Paul's and come home sick, her mother was like, what the heck is going on here? What does a couple in their 20s want with a 15-year-old girl? And she got suspicious. You know, she didn't know exactly if anything was going on. She didn't know if anything nefarious was going on, but it definitely seemed odd to her. So Carla and Paul thought having them over for dinner would show Jane's mother that they were good, normal people and they just enjoyed, you know, hanging out with her teenage daughter. What actually happened was Paul complained about his parents the whole time, causing Jane's mother to feel even more suspicious because of the volatile way he was speaking about them. However, Jane was coming up on her 16th birthday and her mother had realized that the dynamic had shifted as Jane left childhood and approached adulthood. It was really harder now to tell her what to do. Jane had already integrated nicely into Paul and Carla's lives and she would willingly join them during some sexual activities, but she wouldn't go all the way and she actually preferred to be with Paul alone but not while Carla was around because it made her feel bad. The impression that I kind of get from the whole Jane, Carla, Paul thing is Jane was young. Jane really liked Carla and, you know, Paul was cool, whatever. And it was fun to like, you know, be flirted with by him and made to feel pretty and special by him. And she didn't mind, you know, kissing here or there and kind of maybe taking it a little bit further, but she also felt guilty. Because even though Carla gave her permission and seemed to support this whole thing, Jane still felt bad that she was like being with Carla's husband. Because it's not normal. On July 22nd, 1991, Constable Michael Crenshaw arrived at 57 Bayview Drive to interview Carla and Paul. Now, he was the identification officer for the Niagara Regional Police, and he'd been working on the Leslie Mahaffey case, but he wasn't there to talk about Leslie. He was responding to a report of a robbery. Carla and Paul had called the police, claiming that while they'd been in Hawaii, their house had been broken into. Paul, of course, had a detailed list for the insurance company. VCRs, cameras, Carla's ring, Paul's watch, cash, etc., valued at over $30,000. Now, the insurance policy for these items had been taken out just six weeks prior. But things were starting to settle down, right? The newness of the wedding and the honeymoon had worn off and the couple were feeling restless, searching for a new rush to add a zest to their lives. They were looking for a new girl to bring home and they had to pick the right one. Paul was infatuated with a waitress at a place that he and Carla would go to for beer and wings and they followed her home a few times 
and Paul recorded her undressing through her window while Carla stood by and watched him recording this girl. When he could barely keep the camera steady, he had to get himself right back to the car and take care of himself, which amused Carla. She let him do his thing in the car and she stripped down and did cartwheels outside of the car naked. On August 10th, Jane was at Paul and Carla's house and they were drinking. They were having a good time when Carla decided that this was the night to drug Jane. Carla didn't like when they would bring these girls in who were you know, willing to hang out with them and who were aware of what was happening, sort of. She didn't like when these girls came in and, and kind of just wanted to, to be with Paul and not be with them both at the same time. So Carla thought, you know, this is the night that I am going to force myself into this situation. So she began making Jane drinks mixed with crushed up halcyon. And when Jane fell asleep, out came the halothane. Around 3.30 a.m., Jane stopped breathing and panicked. Carla called 911, but then she went over and slapped Jane in the face a few times and Jane started breathing again. So Carla called back and canceled the 911 call, telling them it had been a false alarm. Can you imagine just like, my friend's not breathing and then two minutes later you're like, false alarm, she's breathing again, you don't need to come. I don't know what happens in Canada, but here, if you call 911, and you say something like that, really, if you call 911 and say anything, they're still going to come, I promise. Not wanting a repeat of the Tammy incident, Paul and Carla stayed up all night to make sure Jane kept breathing. Paul insisted on it. But obviously, things with Jane could not really go on much longer. Her mother was getting suspicious, She'd told her horse riding instructor that Paul had like touched her and the horse riding instructor had told her mother and her mother had confronted Paul but still let Jane go over to his house. They'd need to find someone else. Maybe having a girl who was like willing to do these things with them wasn't the best because she could become a liability. Now Jane continued to spend time with the couple. Paul brought them out to see Phantom of the Opera, out to eat at restaurants where he told Jane to pretend she was his girlfriend while Carla sat on the other side of the table and watched. Sometimes when Paul was upset with Carla, Carla would come in and ask Jane to go make Paul feel better. In October, Carla and Paul celebrated four years of knowing each other. Well, Carla celebrated, giving him cards full of intimate details and voicing a desire to get back on track, which suggests to me at least Paul was pulling away. He got bored easily and Carla could really no longer hold his attention, which she was perceptive enough to pick up on. She was telling her friends and family how much she loved him, how badly she wanted to get pregnant with his child. She wrote to him, Once we were an unbeatable team, you and me against the world. We are the perfect couple. We've just gotten sidetracked. Some couples were meant to be, and we are one of those. Please, honey, let's try and have the fairy tale marriage like we were meant to. I know what happened to us is all my fault, and believe me, I am changing. I love you too much to lose you. And that's really the crux of the whole thing. Paul wasn't forcing her to do these things, or to even stay with him. There was times when Paul pulled away. There was never times when Carla pulled away. She loved him so much, she would have done anything for him, anything. She would sell her own soul to the devil before she lost him, and she did. The following December, Paul's sister Debbie finally filed charges against Kenneth Bernardo, her father, and Paul's like adopted father. The abuse of her childhood was still a vivid memory, and she was 100% sure her father was doing the same thing to Debbie's four-year-old daughter, Samantha. It was the last straw. Now, it's worth noting that later, Paul would actually write a letter to the court in support of Kenneth Bernardo, saying, um, you know, I don't know why my sister's bringing all this up now. This is in the past. Nothing's happening, which is crazy to me. But it does make sense. Paul could never forgive Kenneth Bernardo for not being his real father, for lying to him about not being his real father. But he could understand and forgive these horrible, twisted, dark sexual impulses that he could forgive, that he could explain away. Jane spent Christmas with Carla and Paul, and there were many presents under the tree for her. A gunned shaggy dog that Paul told her cost $300 because she deserved only the best. Paul gave her a gold necklace and a watch, calling it his boyfriend gift, but this whole thing was wearing thin on Jane. She felt bad for Carla because Paul would convince her to do things, holding her friendship with Carla over her head. He told her that if she didn't do what he asked, Carla wouldn't want to be friends with her. And he always compared her to Carla's dead sister, Tammy. There was pictures of Tammy all over the house. There was like a big framed picture of Tammy that was on top of the TV all the time in their house. Jane tried to turn to Carla. She explained that she wasn't there for Paul. 
You know, Paul was fine, he was cool, but he was like much older than her. She wanted to spend time with Carla. She wanted to be friends with Carla. To which Carla replied, well, he's the best thing that could ever happen to you and you don't know what you're missing. One night, Jane finally did it. She confronted Paul and she told him she didn't want to have sex with him. And after that, both Paul and Carla ignored her for the rest of the night. When she would speak, they'd act like she hadn't spoken. So Jane asked if Carla was okay. Carla responded that, yeah, she was okay, but she's a bit upset with Jane for her decision. And then she and Paul went upstairs and they didn't come back down. It was then that Jane stopped feeling bad for Carla. And bless her heart, she finally realized this woman was not her friend. Did not have her best interest at heart. She called her mom to pick her up and she never looked back. She never went back to Carla and Paul's house. In April of 1992, Detective Irwin, one of the lead investigators on the Scarborough rapist case, sorted through 230 DNA samples and he picked out five. Now they were the only five that matched the non-secretor status and he resubmitted those five samples to the Center for Forensic Science for further testing. Paul Bernardo's sample was one of those five. On April 16th, Paul and Carla went out hunting for another sex slave. This time, someone Carla would pick out. She had promised Paul she would help him acquire 50 sex slaves, so they really needed to get started. But they had a strict criteria. This girl had to be a virgin, so Carla suggested they drive by Holy Cross and Lakeport High Schools around 3 p.m. It was Easter weekend, and all the students would be dismissed early and they'd be eager to get home and get their holidays started. The sidewalk would be filled with young girls and they could take their pick. Carla had even pulled strings at work so that she was able to get out by noon that day. Kristen French was 15 years old, a student at Holy Cross. She was a responsible, dark-haired young lady who'd been a Girl Scout and loved rowing and figure skating. She'd made honor roll that year and also spent time volunteering at a nursing home. Kristen wore her boyfriend Elton's ring on the middle finger of her left hand, and on her right arm she wore a leather-strapped Mickey Mouse watch her parents had brought her back from Florida. She was going to be turning 16 on May 10th, and she'd already made a concise list of what she wanted for her birthday so her parents and her boyfriend wouldn't have to wonder. When the bell rang at 2.40, Kristen grabbed her bag and coat, excited to get home and start her long weekend. She had the same routine every school day. It took only 15 minutes to walk home, and then she would feed her dog Sasha and then let Sasha outside. It was raining softly as she began walking home, thinking of what she was going to wear to the Easter dance that weekend, eager to get home and call her boyfriend Elton. When Elton called the French's house at 3.30, Kristen's father said she wasn't home yet, and that was strange because she usually was by now. At 4, Elton called again, and once again, Mr. French was perplexed when he told the young man his daughter wasn't home yet. Kristen was never late. She had her schedule. She worked like clockwork, and she never disappeared without letting her parents know where she was. Kristen would never make it home to play with Sasha or try on 12 different dresses before choosing the one to wear that weekend. She had been walking home when an attractive blonde woman called out to her from a car parked at the Grace Lutheran Church. Maybe if it had been a single man, Kristen would have kept walking or even run. But this young woman had a map in her hand. She looked confused, harmless, lost. Why would a woman want to hurt a young girl? So Kristen jogged over to the car to help with directions. As soon as she got close enough, Paul shot out from the driver's seat and held a knife to the back of her neck. Carla jumped into the back seat and Paul forced Kristen into the front passenger seat. Carla then grabbed Kristen's long, beautiful, dark hair and pulled her head down so she wasn't visible. They drove Kristen back to their house and blindfolded her before Carla went inside and disconnected all the phones, closed all the blinds, and locked all the doors. Then she went into the garage to tell Paul it was all clear. He could bring their new acquisition inside. The same things happened to Kristen that happened to Leslie. I don't need to get into the details. Once again, it was awful to read about and it would be just as awful to repeat. Paul took her upstairs with his video camera. Carla stayed in the kitchen and made dinner. Paul fed Kristen alcoholic drinks and when she threw up, Carla came in to clean it up. When Kristen was undressed, Carla noticed there was a cut on her neck from the knife Paul had used to force her into the car. Carla cleaned it with peroxide and put a band-aid on the wound. Then she left her husband with the young girl again. Paul brought Kristen downstairs for dinner and they took her blindfold off. And while they ate, Carla chatted with Kristen about Kristen's boyfriend, Elton, about Kristen's dog, Sasha. And then Paul brought Kristen back upstairs and Carla cleaned up from dinner. Now that night, Carla held the camera while Paul humiliated and assaulted Kristen. Carla can be heard in this videotape telling Kristen to smile and repeat the words that Paul wants her to say. 
Kristen obliges, hoping that if she does what they want, they'll let her go home. But like I said, the blindfold was gone. There was no way Paul and Carla were going to let Kristen go, no matter what they told her, no matter what they told the world afterwards. When Paul wanted to give Kristen Halcyon that night to make sure she slept and didn't try to escape, Carla said no. She knew enough about the drug through her research to realize it could be found during an autopsy. Carla knew Kristen wasn't leaving that house alive. These two people were sick. They held this girl in their house knowing she was not going to survive. They had dinner with her. Paul drew her a bath in their jacuzzi tub and recorded her while she took a bath. Then Carla brought out all her cosmetics and perfumes and they did each other's makeup and talked about different perfumes and lipsticks they liked. Now, of course, Kristen French was not enjoying herself at all. She had been abused and sexually assaulted by Paul. She was terrified and confused, but she played along, still hoping if she did, they would let her go. Paul told Carla to dress in a schoolgirl's outfit and recorded them together. After this, Paul went to McDonald's to get dinner for them meaning Kristen was left alone with Carla. Carla could have let her go. Carla could have called for help. Carla could have even walked herself into a door and told Paul that Kristen had attacked her and escaped. Carla did none of this. Before Paul left, he tied Kristen to a chair while cheerfully asking her what movies she wanted him to get from Blockbuster. While Paul was gone, Carla let Kristen watch the six o'clock news, which featured her own father begging for her safe return. Kristen began crying and threw up again. At one point during her imprisonment, Paul told Kristen to tell Carla she loved her. He used his wife's name. He said, tell Carla you love her. And you can hear Kristen in the, the videotape say, Carla, is that your name? Now I am unsure if they killed Kristen eventually because of what she'd seen, what she'd heard, what she knew, or if Kristen finally had enough and she began to talk back. Paul had told her if she kept doing things wrong, he would kill her. He told her three strikes and you're out. But the things he wanted her to do, she wasn't experienced in. And she was frustrated because she was trying to make him happy. She was trying to keep him calm. But he kept yelling at her because she was messing up in doing what he wanted. And at one point, she called him a bastard, which was the exact same thing that his mother had called him when he was 16. Paul didn't like this, and Paul and Carla became more violent and mean to Kristen after she said this. Kristen French's last videotaped words to Paul were, I don't know how your wife can stand being around you. That evening, Paul left again to grab dinner and movies. He was buying Kristen her last meal, chicken dinner from Swiss Chalet, her favorite restaurant with extra fries. Kristen French was dead before Paul and Carla went to the Homokas for Easter dinner. According to Carla, Kristen had been strangled by Paul with an electric cord while Carla was downstairs blow drying her hair because she couldn't stand to watch it. Kristen's body was found on Thursday, April 30th, thrown into a ditch just yards away from where Leslie Mahaffey had been laid to rest. She was naked, her beautiful long hair had been cut off. Because the way that the two girls had been found was so different, police didn't think there was any connection between Leslie and Kristen, which is absolutely ridiculous. They said Kristen being found so close to where Leslie was buried was just a coincidence. The FBI put together a criminal profile for the Kristen French case, stating that there were two perpetrators to be on the lookout for. Their ages would range from 20 to 35. One would be more dominant, the other more docile. This would be the first mention of two suspects. But the FBI believed both suspects were males. Just like Kristen French, they couldn't figure out a reason why a woman would want to hurt a young girl. Both of these offenders would have low self-esteem and show poor social and interpersonal skills, especially with women. They would be longtime friends and inseparable. The dominant suspect would have a long record of sexual assaults, and he may have abducted or attempted to abduct a woman before, motivated by sexual fantasy. The less dominant suspect would follow along, but may have developed a connection with Kristen, considering someone had taken enough care to clean and bandage the knife cut on her neck. The pathologists could not agree on her time of death. One said she'd been deceased for as long as two weeks. The other said she'd been killed shortly before being found. I'm so glad it's not the 90s anymore because if you've been trained as a forensic pathologist and you can't tell due to rate of decomposition whether a person has been dead a few days or a few weeks, that's a problem in an investigation. And I just can't stand to think about the massive amounts of DNA evidence Paul and Carla left on their victims. Saliva, semen, dog hair, carpet fragments, etc. Those things would have been easily explainable on Tammy Homolka. But Leslie and Kristen? Her neck was bruised. Her entire body was bruised. She'd been severely beaten before her death. Even her rib cage showed bruising. Kristen's funeral was held on May 4th. 
the same day, coincidentally, that Carla Homolka turned 22. The next day, the Green Ribbon Task Force was officially formed in St. Catharines. Its goal was to investigate the death of Kristen French. An eyewitness had come forward claiming she believed she'd witnessed Kristen's abduction when she'd been out running errands. She'd seen a dark-haired girl being forced into a car in a parking lot, but she'd initially thought it was just some kids messing around. She described the vehicle as cream-colored, definitely a sports car, maybe a Camaro or a Trans Am. Now, Paul didn't drive a cream-colored anything. He definitely didn't drive a Camaro. He drove a gold Nissan, and it was a sportier car, so, you know, the, the eyewitness got that right. But this eyewitness, this woman who saw this all go down, she admitted herself, like, I don't know anything about cars. So I'm not sure why the police took her statement on the description of the car so seriously. But additionally, another woman phoned in Paul's car and license plate to the police twice. The first time was in March of 1991, when she noticed this gold car stalking her and her sister, like following them from work to home. The second time was on April 17th when she saw his car again. She was just driving. She saw this dude driving in his car and she's like, that's the car, that's the guy that's been stalking me. She called the police again. She was like, I saw the guy who was stalking me. Here's his license plate. Here's what car he has. This was April 17th when Kristen French was still alive at Paul's house and he was driving out to get her dinner. Nothing ever happened. The police were looking all over the place for this cream colored Camaro. So apparently they didn't think that this woman's stalker, who she called in twice about, was connected to Kristen French. If the police had taken this tip seriously, or at least checked into it, they would have found Kristen French alive at the home of Paul Bernardo and Carla Homoka, but they didn't. The head of this task force was 35-year-old Inspector Vince Bevan. Now, Bevan had started his career in law enforcement in July of 1973 with the Niagara Regional Police Service. When he took over the French case, he was young, he was ready to go, ready to make a name for himself. But this guy had tunnel vision when it came to this Camaro, thinking that finding the cream-colored Camaro would be the key to finding the person or persons who had taken Kristen. Now, it seemed that Paul's old friend and neighbor, Van, had been chatting with the police while pouring coffee at his father's diner. An OPP officer named Rob Haney phoned in a tip to the task force tip line about a man named Paul Bernardo who had been questioned about the Scarborough rapes and whose friends said he was aggressive towards women. He also said that during a time Paul had been in Florida, a rape had taken place there. The tip line finally took a look at this report on May 11th. So Sergeant Nesbitt of the Green Ribbon Task Force ran Paul through the CPIC. That's the Canadian Police Information Center. Allegedly, this system would have all reports of anyone in Canada who was either charged with a crime or suspected of a crime. Even though Paul had been accused of many things, even though he had been talked to by the police and had his DNA taken in connection with the Scarborough rapist case, he had never been entered into the system. So Sergeant Nesbitt was like, well, he's not in the system. You know, all the FBI profiles say that this suspect's going to have a long list of, you know, other criminal activities. But he brought his partner, Constable Kenny, to pay Paul a visit anyways, simply because it was a lead, not because they really thought he had done anything or he was involved. When Paul answered the door, he listened intently as they told him they were investigating the death of Kristen French. He didn't flinch, his poker face held firm even though inside he was like freaking out. And he invited them into the living room to talk further. The investigators made notes of how clean and orderly his home was. The framed wedding picture on the mantle showing Paul and his pretty wife smiling happily. His put together preppy appearance, how well spoken and normal he seemed. Paul told them that he'd been questioned about the attacks in Scarborough and had willingly supplied them with DNA. He also told them that he was currently working on a rap record while his new wife worked at a vet clinic. When they asked him where he was on April 16th, he immediately responded that he and his wife had been home and he'd been writing lyrics to a new rap song. They also asked him if either he or his wife had owned or driven a Camaro. Now, Paul had been keeping an eye on the news and knew the task force was on the lookout for this cream Camaro, so he happily told them, nope, no Camaro here, we've never had a Camaro. The detectives left 15 minutes after they arrived, and although they did circle the block so they could take a look at Paul's Nissan parked in the driveway from further away to see if it could like be mistaken for a Camaro, they both decided it didn't look anything like a Camaro, and they left. Once again, putting Paul Bernardo out of their minds. When Carla got home from work, Paul bragged to her how he had charmed the pants off some more police officers. 
Carla, however, was not so easily comforted. What if they did suspect him and Paul just didn't know it and they came back with a warrant? It was time they took their videotape collection showing hours of footage featuring Tammy, Leslie, and Kristen and hide them. Paul stowed them away in the ceiling of the garage, nestled in some insulation, a place only he and Carla knew about. On May 15th, Paul also filed a document for a name change. They would no longer be Paul Kenneth Bernardo and Carla Leanne Bernardo. They would now be the Teals, a name taken from the serial killer of Carla's favorite movie, Criminal Law. Paul also changed his middle name from Kenneth to Jason after the murderer from Friday the 13th. Now there's a few reported reasons Paul decided to change their names. One, it was better to be safe than sorry. If the police were looking for Paul Bernardo, he'd no longer exist. He also wanted to distance himself from Kenneth Bernardo, hence the middle name change. There's also evidence that Paul and Carla were both a little or a lot racist. They thought the name Bernardo sounded too ethnic and preferred something more Anglo. However, the next morning, Nesbitt did call the Toronto police to speak to the officers in charge of the Scarborough rapist investigation. After Paul told him that he'd been questioned and given DNA in that investigation, Nesbitt wanted to know more. He was transferred to the voicemail of Steve Irwin and he left a message asking for a call back. Irwin called back eight days later. Why it took over a week to return the call, I have no idea, but they traded notes and stories complaining about how much work they had, how busy they were, and Irwin faxed a couple sheets of paper over to Nesbitt. Nesbitt also read reports of stalking from 1991 where Paul was identified as the stalker. At the end of all of this, even if it was just a little bit of information, it was information that pointed as Paul as maybe more than he appeared to be. Nesbitt decided there was no information he could find connecting the Scarborough case to their investigation in St. Catharines. It was exactly like Paul said it was when Carla was worried that the police were sniffing around and Paul said it was going to be okay. Who was going to suspect two beautiful married people? Who cares if one of those beautiful people was literally one of the five DNA profiles that matched the Scarborough rapist? At the end of May, Carla became very paranoid. She claimed her house was haunted. She would hear someone calling her name, but when she asked her husband what he wanted, he said he hadn't called out for her. She went to a woman named Lori, a psychic, to find out what to do about the restless spirits haunting her, and she was told to pour ammonia down the drains of her home, which she did. This psychic also went to the house, and she told Carla that this wasn't restless spirits they were dealing with. It was the ghost of a woman, an angry woman who did not like Paul. According to Lori, this woman had died suddenly and violently and didn't know she was no longer alive. If ghosts do exist, I truly hope the ghost of Kristen French was scaring the crap out of Carla and Paul. Laura also gave Carla an amethyst, telling her to keep it in her pocket to absorb all the bad karma around her. <laughs> Carla Homoka would need a hell of a lot more than a tiny amethyst stone to put in her pocket to cleanse the bad karma around her. But apparently, the ammonia and the amethyst worked, and Carla was spirit free within two weeks and her and Paul were in a better place in their marriage. Now, if you notice while I tell these stories, I'm going back and forth and telling you what Carla and Paul are doing and then I'm telling you what the police are doing. And I'm doing this purposely because I want you to see that as this huge investigation was going on, looking into crimes that these two people committed, Carla and Paul were living completely normal lives. They weren't freaking out. They weren't, you know, stashing money away or trying to get fake passports to get out of town. They weren't crying in their bedroom, overcome with guilt. They weren't calling into work because they just couldn't face people. They were going about their lives completely normally. So the reason I do this is to show you that although these two things existed in the same time and place, they ran parallel to each other. The police investigating, Carla and Paul living in their fantasy world. So Inspector Vince Bevan certainly made mistakes during his time with the Green Ribbon Task Force. He was obviously too focused on the cream Camaro that didn't exist. He was really disorganized, bad with paperwork, which caused many files to be lost or misplaced. However, I will give him this. He was one of the first people to decide that there might be a connection between Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French after all. Leslie was exhumed so they could compare the two girls to see if they'd been beaten in similar ways. According to the coroner, the marks and abrasions on the two girls were nothing alike, but Bevan was not ready to give up on his hunch yet. He did have more pressing matters at hand though, which was creating and producing this docudrama on Kristen French called the abduction of Kristen French. Inspector Bevan played himself in the documentary and he brought in a cream colored Camaro as well just to be factual. 
Carla and Paul watched this from the comfort of their own home, rolling with laughter. These buffoons would never catch them. They weren't even looking in the right places. Everything in this documentary, all the things that the police and the investigators were using as facts were not factual at all. But the movie brought in thousands of tips, all of them completely pointless and irrelevant, basically, and it sent the task force running in circles, chasing their own tails. That same month, Carla brought home an iguana from her clinic. Spike had been scheduled to be put down, having been brought in by a family that had abused and neglected him. Carla, who had a heart so big for all living creatures besides human beings, brought the iguana home and nursed him back to health. She really loved him, I think, and was proud of herself for helping him get better. So maybe she just loved him because he represented like her abilities to heal. He represented her competence. But in July, Paul's friend Van and his girlfriend Joanne came to visit and Spike bit Joanne on the finger. Now this was a large iguana, um, three feet long. And it was said that uh, the iguana and the dog would just chase each other around the house. And Paul said, that Spike couldn't be allowed to go around biting people. So Paul and Carla needed to discipline him to show him that biting was wrong. They brought Spike into the bedroom, but while Paul was in the middle of this discipline with Carla helping him and assisting him, as always when they're torturing people and things, Spike bit him too. Spike is the real hero of this story. In response, Paul brought Spike into the kitchen, put him on a cutting board and promptly beheaded the iguana. He left the headless iguana on the kitchen counter and told Carla to clean up the mess. Now she did this without complaint. It didn't matter that she had cared about Spike. It didn't matter that she'd spent weeks bringing him back to life only to let Paul kill him. Paul got what Paul wanted and she would do anything to make and keep him happy. Carla skinned and gutted her pet and then later told her coworkers at the clinic that poor Spike had gotten a cold and died. Now this same day that Spike bit Joanne's finger, then bit Paul, then got his head cut off, Paul threw Spike's body on the grill and served him to Carla and their guests. Now, it wouldn't be the first time Carla had eaten something she didn't want to at the behest of Paul. He had previously told her that he wanted her to eat his feces, and she'd done it. Allegedly, Joanne was the only one who didn't eat the iguana meat. Paul ate all his. Carla ate most of hers. Van, you know, picked at it. But Joanne had really liked Spike, and she just couldn't stomach it. She felt responsible for his death. Because normal people experience guilt. Carla and Paul acquired another young girl to replace Tammy and Jane, and her name was Norma. She was 17 and she'd been friends with Tammy before she died. Norma thought that the couple had a beautiful house and a beautiful life. Just being around them made her feel more beautiful, shiny, and new. They brought her shopping into the movies, but Paul would not allow Carla to use Halcyon or Halothane on Norma. He felt that since Tammy and Jane had both stopped breathing after these things were used on them, it was enough of an experiment to know it was bad combo. It was November and Christmas was coming. Christmas was a tough time for Carla and Paul. Paul had never really liked Christmas because he hadn't had that kind of family life, you know, where they celebrated Christmas and had togetherness. It was just kind of always a disappointment. And now Christmas to Paul meant the death of Tammy Homoka, who had died two years before on Christmas Eve. And even before that, Paul had a tradition of attacking women every December. And when Christmas approached, Paul would always pull away from Carla or get kind of cranky with her because he blamed Carla for Tammy's death. So as Norma is becoming more integrated into their life, Paul is kind of pulling away from Carla and she senses this again. On December 13th, Paul and Carla took Norma to the Toronto Sky Dome to watch the Kennel Club Christmas Classic, and then out to dinner at the CN Tower, where they ordered her a strawberry daiquiri. Then they checked into the Royal York Hotel, where Carla videotaped an agile Norma doing backflips across their hotel room. Carla also recorded Norma and Paul kissing. Her voice can be heard urging them to do more. Eventually, Carla drank a little bit too much and passed out, leaving Norma and Paul alone. Now, like Jane, Norma enjoyed being around the couple because they were fun. 
To her, they represented this perfect life. They were older, they were cool, they let her drink, they brought her to places, they bought her things. She didn't mind a little kissing while Carla was there, and obviously supportive of it, but she had no desire to go any further with Paul, especially when Carla was sleeping. It felt like she was going behind Carla's back and Norma really liked Carla. When Paul tried to get her to go further, Norma said no, but she did agree to help Paul set the hotel on fire. They took a can of hairspray and lit a serving cart on fire before running back into their room. And Paul took video footage of the fire trucks pulling up while the sound of the smoke alarms blared in the background. This is just more evidence of a person who has thrill-seeking behavior, a person who gets bored and needs to do something to snap themselves out of that boredom. Now, as the anniversary of Tammy's death approached, Paul was getting more restless, crankier. Tammy's death was something that had simultaneously brought Carla and Paul closer together, but drove a wedge between them. It brought them closer together because they shared this intense secret, a secret that if either one of them revealed, it would ruin them both. But it drove them further apart because Paul always blamed Carla. Additionally, their little pet Jane had abandoned them last Christmas, and Paul didn't want that to happen with Norma. So for the past two Christmases, essentially, he had lost a young girl that was like valuable to him, special to him. It was the reason Paul hadn't let Carla drug Norma. It was the reason that when Christmas did roll around, he lavished Norma with expensive Christmas gifts. He didn't want to lose her. He got her a stuffed animal, a gold necklace, a watch, a little ankle bracelet, all top of the line. Of course, Paul let Norma know how expensive these items have been, only the best for her. They watched some TV, they had some drinks, and then Carla suddenly announced that she was going to bed but she'd be sleeping in the guest bedroom that night, leaving Norma with Paul in the master bedroom. Now that night, Norma got sick of Paul groping at her, so she left the bed to sleep on the floor, but the next morning she woke up in bed next to Paul with no recollection of how she had gotten there. On Christmas Day, Paul and Carla went to the Homolkas to open presents and celebrate the holiday together. That night, after having too much to drink, Carla cried to Paul about having a baby. When would they start trying? Paul had previously told her as soon as his rap career got off the ground, they could have a baby because that makes complete sense. But it didn't seem like he was really doing anything to get his rap career off the ground. He kept pushing it, pushing it. Next year, two years, he didn't want to have a baby. She wanted to have a baby with him because she wanted to keep him. She wanted something eternally to tie him to her. This is a girl who will use a baby as a band-aid for a broken relationship. That night, Paul and Carla slept in her sister Lori's room with Lori. It seemed like no one wanted to really sleep in Tammy's room. It just felt wrong. Paul and Lori chatted in the dark while Carla slept. And Paul told Lori that Carla was a lot of work and she always needed to be taken care of. She never did anything without being told what to do first and it was exhausting. Lori also noted that Paul was naked under his blanket and he told her that if she ever needed anyone killed to let him know. She thought he just drank too much, but it definitely scared her. The Saturday after Christmas, Norma visited Paul and Carla again, but this time she brought a boy she'd been seeing. His name was Brian. Paul kept demanding Norma say that she loved him while this kid's like right here watching this, to which she replied, she didn't love him. He was much older than her and she had a boyfriend. Carla told Norma at this point the same thing she told Jane. Paul is the best thing that could ever happen to you. He could love you. He could give you everything you ever wanted. Norma decided that this whole dynamic was weird and she told Paul and Carla she wouldn't be coming back, which was a really good decision on her part because just a few days before, Paul and Carla had been talking about Norma and Paul told Carla that he'd gone all the way with Norma. Carla was annoyed and said she wanted in, but Paul said he didn't think Norma was into girls. Carla said she could just easily put Norma down, just like Jane. Paul hit her in the face a few times, sending the message again that they would no longer be drugging these girls. When Norma left them for good, Paul beat on Carla again, saying it was her fault they'd lost another one. Because of Carla, they were always losing girls one way or the other. This was the third Christmas in a row that they'd lost someone. If Paul Bernardo had had a loose grip on reality before the departure of Norma, did not help things. He went to Montreal with some friends for New Year's Eve to clear his head, and when he came back, he beat Carla badly with a flashlight, leaving her with two black eyes. On January 5th, Dorothy Homoka paid her daughter a surprise visit at work. She'd gotten two anonymous phone calls telling her to go find Carla and look at her face, so that is what she did. Carla confessed that Paul had been hitting her, and Dorothy told her to go home, pack up some things, and they'd come back, pick her up that evening, and take her away from Paul forever. 
When Dorothy and Carl arrived at Paul and Carla's that night at the pre-agreed upon time, no one answered the door. Dorothy called the police and called the house phone, but she didn't get a hold of anyone until 9.30 when Paul answered and put Carla on the phone. Carla told her family she was fine, they should just let it go, and leave. The next day, the Hamokas returned to find Carla at home alone, and if it was possible, she looked worse than she had the day before. According to Carla, they had gone on a cigarette run the night before, and Paul had beat her the entire ride there and back. This time, her parents would not take no for an answer. They brought Carla to a friend's house, and on the way, Carla made vague statements suggesting that Paul had been responsible for the death of Tammy. The friend that Carla went to was a girl named Corina. She knew Lori, and her husband was a Toronto police officer. Corina persuaded Carla to go to the hospital where she was examined, and the emergency room doctor at St. Catherine's General said it was the worst case of abuse he had ever seen. Paul was arrested and charged with assault with a weapon. They didn't keep him overnight, though. They sent him home, where he fell into a deep spiral of depression. He chased pills with vodka and called Carla over and over again, begging her to come home, apologizing for everything. He said he needed her, and if she didn't come back, he was going to take his own life. I've been here for five days alone. It's not a long time, but it's, it's hard when you're alone. It's pretty hard, pal. I walk to the house sometimes. I go, car? Car? Carla? Car? Hey, car? Well, I don't get any answer. It would not be long before everything came crashing down on Paul Bernardo. Carla would start talking. Various police forces would start putting the pieces together. All the dirty little secrets that Paul and Carla had stashed away like demented squirrels would be revealed to the world. Ken and Barbie's perfect life, perfect image, perfect smiles, they would be blackened forever. But Carla would have several weeks of telling her side of the story, spinning her own narrative, before Paul Bernardo would even be in custody. And what would follow would be one of the most controversial and dramatic trials Canada has ever seen the result of which still confounds and confuses people to this day. And that's where we will pick up in the third and final part of the series. Next time, we'll talk about how Carla managed to finagle herself a sweetheart deal with the Canadian police, how it suddenly became a race of self-preservation between Paul and Carla, who loved each other so much, who in the past had been each other's rock, had been each other's happy and safe place, had been everything to the other person, right? And suddenly they turned on each other as if they were mortal enemies. And we'll talk about the aftermath, how this affected the families of Kristen French, Leslie Mahaffey, how this affected Canada. Where are Paul and Carla today? There's a lot coming up in part three, so stay tuned. Make sure you check out the link for Scentbird in the description box if you're interested in checking it out. Thank you so much to my Patreons who really keep me going on a daily basis. And thank you to all of you out there who are watching and who continue to come back and watch. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter if you're interested in finding out more about my life behind the scenes, what's happening. Sometimes we'll do little videos like Q and A's and things. So if I do do a Q and A, I usually ask on Instagram what you guys want to ask me. So follow me there if you haven't already and make sure you subscribe, like, and comment on this video because interaction with the video helps the video succeed. Thank you so much for being here. Stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and stay home. And I'll see you next time. Straight